this second day with another one of the supporters at our university in questions having to do with teaching and learning. Marit Ombud Nielsen is a vice rector, as we say, for education at our university. And I should also like to remind you that Marit is the vice, what is the title you use in Norges Universitet? Uh, the vice chair? I think so. Yeah. The vice chair in Norges Universitet. So Marit is very relevant to the kinds of discussions that we are having. And without saying anything else, I would just like to invite Marit to come up on the podium and open the second day for us. Thank you. Thank you, Odgeir. <clears throat> I wish you all heartily welcome to the second day of this visionary conference. I'm sure you had a successful day yesterday. We at the uh, University of Agda are pleased and honored, especially by the presence of Martha Russell, Keith Devlin, and Eilif Sonsen, of course. And I must tell you that Stanford is in fact the university where I, once upon a time in 1979, presented my first international paper ever on a conference called the Fourth International Conference of Historical Linguistics. My conference on Old Norse word order was, of course, written on an ordinary typewriter, like everything else at the time. I should add that my master thesis from 1973, in fact, was handwritten, like many master theses by my contemporary student friends, particularly in linguistics or philology, to be exact, from that period, a period which incontestably seems much closer to the Stone Age than we are today. I should also add that it was not until the, the early 90s that the computer came and saved my doctoral dissertation from the same fate, the typewriter, the correction ink, the copies. Luckily, the, top, uh, the uh, typewriter is long gone. Today we profit by a lot of devices enabling us to concentrate more on our proper subjects and less on practical matters. Or is this completely true? In our digital university project, we have a sub-project called Digital Exams. We aim at digitalizing as many of our written tests and exams as possible. Why? Because, in fact, there are stronger similarities than we probably like to admit between me as a master student of uni the University of Bergen in 1973 and the ordinary student of today, although she, of course, writes her master thesis on a computer. But what do we ask students to do at most of the exams? We ask them to sit down in isolation, take up their pens and compose an essay, usually on paper, which includes two copies. That is, they have to use more force than when they write on a computer. But what is worse, we deprive them of the possibility of editing their papers properly, deprive them of using some of the skills they have already developed in school before they entered the university. During study hours, they seldom write by hand. Few students practice much handwriting at all. Universities seem to neglect this fact. One of my colleagues and friends here at the university, she is 70 now and retired, although she still works part-time here. She is also a, study, a student of Spanish. I can assure you that her experience of writing 17 pages by hand during four hours at one of her written exams two years ago was not a very good one. She openly expressed her frustration. This is just one example of the fact that we do lag behind when it comes to practices and ideals of pedagogics that we want to fulfill. And it incontestably stands in a striking contrast to my own grandchildren's favorite occupation during Eastern holiday. I just went together with them to a resort and went skiing. What did my nine-year-old grandchild do when he got the chance? Yes. He took his father's iPad and played math games. <clears throat> the digital university here at our university 
uh, in Agda is a very good start. An institution that aims at taking part in a new learning society must dare to invest. The University of Agda invested 12 million in 2012 and 10 million in, uh, in 11 and 10 million in 2012. And I do hope that we can continue this focused commitment. As Vice Rector of Education, I strongly support and applaud this project. But I must admit that I would like to, us to be even more focused in the future, to develop a more consistent strategy. I hope we can prioritize this project and allocate some 10 million per year until 2025 at least. As far as I understand, the Future Learning Lab's main vision is to foresee the challenges of the future and also to develop an increased awareness of the fact that new technologies are not merely, techno merely technologies, but strongly depend on human action and interaction. To be successful in learning technologies, the human element has to be included, as it said on one of the leaflets of the conference. Ways of learning are changing. Use of technology is an ongoing discussion. Learning takes place throughout work life, of which my 70 years old friend, whom I just mentioned, is a very good example. And as it is also said on the leaflet, the field of learning is ripe for innovation from many perspectives and stakeholders. We, as a university, are one of the evident stakeholders, powerful as we are, when it comes to designing the formal education of young people of today. We should not let them down. Back to my situation as a student in, 19, uh, in the 60s. I was a student at the University of Bergen from 67 to 73. I called my parents at home from a telephone box once a week in a striking contrast to the many ways of online communication offered today. There was very little interaction between the community of Bergen and the university, at least, at least as far as I remember. The university formed a society rather separated from the rest of the city, an ivory tower, in spite of its rather central location. We have seen a radical change during a relatively short time when it comes to contact between universities and society. The revised strategy of our, of our, of our own university openly expresses this change. The ivory tower has tumbled down, or maybe it has deliberately been built down. I'm not sure about which of these verbs is the correct one. The act of tumbling down is a rather passive one while the building down needs a proper agent. When it comes to the development of the universities, I think there has been a mixture of tumbling down and being built down. The forces are not totally joined. The opening towards society, in a broad sense, may also represent a threat to the classic academic. Today, the cooperation and collaboration between industry, innovation, uh, entrepreneurship on the one hand, public sector and the university form one new and promising, uh, one of the new and promising scenarios. However, I just talked to one of my advisors who recently attended a seminar in Malmö, Sweden, where Christer Esplund strongly advocated that we should talk, talk about a quad rather than a triple helix. One instance seems to be lacking in the triple helix model, he says, arguing that we also need to take the proper entrepreneurs or the innovators themselves as agents into consideration if we want to succeed. He calls these persons professional place managers. These persons in themselves should be added to the helix, he says. I think Asplund underlines what you also focus on in the Future Learning Lab project. The human aspect, the visionaries, whether you choose to change the model of triple helix or not. But how can we at University of Agda participate and give our contribution to the development and challenges of global education? I have not the answer, but I wish you my very best for the second day of the conference, hoping that this event may shed some light on this crucial question. Thank you.
in sum, there are so many things to summarize that I won't even try. Rather, what I think we should do is Take that away again. <clears throat> Are you happy with this way? Yeah. Okay. So in a short period of time, I'd like to tell you a lot because I admire so much the challenge that you've undertaken to do something new and to step out of an old mold and to find new ways of uh, approaching learning and to bring the human sciences and technology together in order to do that. I'll start by telling you a little bit about some of my experiences in uh, new forms of technology, new forms of education. Then I'll tell you a little bit about MediaX at Stanford University. And then I want to talk to you about communities, building communities and some of the research and experience that I've had uh, in terms of building communities, especially those that are 
uh, based on technology and new technology. This. Ah, so, so um, going to the pre-internet, oh, is it working now? Okay. So before the internet, uh, there were uh, experiments in community building for education. And my first uh, university research experience was in the land-grant colleges. Some of you may know that it's a uh, in the mid 1800s, uh, a law was passed in the United States that created in every state a university that had as its one of its main missions uh, science and technology, creating those and transferring them for the farmers and the mechanics in the state. In other words, it was an industry-oriented uh, technology transfer program, and to do that, they organized in the counties an agent who would communicate with the researchers at the university. And in the legislatures of the state, there were committees that were established who also would uh, be in touch with the university administrators at the state level. The states in the United States were organized into regional and there was a national level. And so at, uh, from the county to the national level, the research agendas were established and um, brought forward into the research that was conducted through state monies through federal monies. And uh, internationally, uh, some critical issues were identified. One of those that I was involved with was acid rain. <clears throat> and this was one of the early citizen science projects. And I think it's interesting, especially today when you think about how fast information moves. But what we did was around the world using, in, in association with the agricultural experiment stations in countries around the world, identified citizens who were willing to put test tubes in their backyards, collect the rain, and on a periodic basis with guidelines we had established, test the pH of the rainwater, record it, and twice a year send those records to Washington, D.C., where we made the spreadsheets, punched the cards, and ran them through the computer analyzed, did the reports, and mimeographed the reports, and sent them by mail back to the people who were collecting data. We were thrilled at an 18-month turnaround. Fast forward, uh, some of the results of that, I think, have been of benefit here in Norway, as uh, the acid rain has, uh, by decades since then, be de been decreasing. Let's go forward to the dawn of the Internet. There were new educational activities uh, that were developed in that period of time. One of them was, uh, and I was at the University of Minnesota at the time that biotech emerged. Me too. <laughs> and so uh, the critical issues that were debated in the academic council were how much industry money can we accept without feeling that industry is buying the uh, biotech researchers and the academic senate passed a rule that a department's research budget could include no more than 33 percent funding from industry pretty interesting that was just before uh, laws uh, antitrust laws were liberalized in the u.s allowing pre-competitive r d to be sponsored by uh, groups of companies um, in the university and I led one of the programs at the University of Minnesota called the Microelectronic and Information Sciences Center, which had five companies collaborating to give each of them a couple million dollars to the university to establish some new programs. Because in Minnesota, we had a big issue. The engineers uh, who could develop integrated circuits were going to California. And we had companies like Control Data, Sperry, Univac, Honeywell, 3M, Cray, that were growing up in Minnesota but had a hard time hiring the engineers that they needed. So we said, well, we'll grow some. And so this program was a, an effort to do that. And you know that the production cycle of a university is a seven-year cycle. That's the time that it takes to bring in a new graduate student, get 
uh, let them have the preliminary um, education that the requirements that they need, choose a topic, do research, and get a PhD. That's a little bit different than some of the other cycles in, and I agree with you that the, it's more c complex than the triple helix, but it's, the academic cycle is longer than the, than the government cycle, which in Minnesota we elected a new governor every two years, and it's longer than the business cycle, which had to report on a quarterly basis. So about year four of this seven-year cycle, we had uh, seven departments that had new equipment, that had uh, new professors brought in, new students. The governor of Minnesota uh, came in who wanted to make his claim to fame uh, protecting the environment of the state. Well, it's a beautiful state, and the environment needed protecting, of course. But what he did was to succeed in passing legislation that was so punitive to the semiconductor manufacturers, 3M went to Austin, Texas. Honeywell went to Phoenix, Arizona. So by the time we got to year seven in our plan, we were educating engineers not only to go to California, but to go to Texas and Arizona, which is to say that planning is important, but staying continually, uh, thank you, uh, on top of the plan to revise it as needed and as the conditions change is absolutely important too. About that time, Minnesota wasn't the only state that was having a shortage of uh, computer scientists and electrical engineers. And a consortium of companies got together and said, we've got to have uh, our employees educated in the fields that we need them to be expert in. And so with the backing of the Association for Computing Machinery, probably the oldest and largest uh, association of uh, people interested in computing software, put together the National Technological University. Drawing from faculty around the country, they put together a curriculum program and uh, it was delivered via satellite in each of the participating companies, uh, an employee who had that expertise who, or who had taken the course was in charge essentially as a proctor in the uh, company room for helping the other employees who were coming in to take the class uh, through the course. And uh, degrees were offered through that. Um, other Innovative uh, approaches to education that took place kind of during the dawn of the internet included one that is now called Capella University. At the time that I headed up the interdisciplinary studies of the emerging school, it was called the Graduate School of America. This was really interesting because in Minnesota there was a very well-known toy company called Tonka Toys. And in the era of uh, world-class manufacturing and when people uh, came to awareness of the opportunity for outsourcing, one of the companies in Minnesota that did the best job of outsourcing was Tonka Toys. Their CEO was a lawyer from uh, Yale Law School, Steve Shank, and he was the first president of the Graduate School of America. He brought the know-how, the management style, and the business sense of outsourcing for the production of toy trucks to graduate education. Uh, that school has grown and uh, now is probably second to the University of Phoenix in uh, size in terms of the online schools that um, grant degrees. So some of the things that we're looking at are feel new, but they have roots in the past. The Internet, too, was a consortium. Again, thinking about building communities that are oriented to uh, learning and educational technologies. A consortium of companies and universities that were established in the 90s with the objective of creating kind of a sandbox like ARPANET had been for the Internet. But this would be Internet, too, a sandbox for a high bandwidth communication and um, IPv6 protocols. Um, the critical infrastructure was laid, Atlantic to Pacific, 
San Diego to Alaska, the engineers were mobilized. There was no content for them to work with. So we called a, um, a summit and brought together the social scientists and the engineers from, from the collaborating institutions to work together to create a research agenda for the social sciences that would put content on internet too so that the engineers could work on uh, the new protocols. Uh, Stanford was well represented at that uh, summit and um, is actually the beginning of my association with, with Stanford. Well, the internet too and the educational opportunities, the learning opportunities um, that the current internet has brought includes social media, it includes YouTube. Uh, we've had some conversations about students and uh, employees using YouTube as um, learning resources. Um, as these new um, technologies have become adopted, so one of the folks who studies uh, technology uh, organizational change and innovation uh, at Stanford is Woody Powell and he has looked across uh, communities where innovation has happened and he identifies a critical factor for um, employees oops, sorry, uh, doing well uh, at uh, bridging this gap. He calls them amphibians and he says one of the characteristics of them is they can live in land, they can live in water. They can be in uh, the university, they can function in industry. And these amphibians in the communities that he has studied are a key um, element of the, an innovation ecosystem. Some of the thoughts that I'm going to share with you today kind of focus on uh, shared vision as uh, a means for transformation and um, they do, fo it also focuses on these special people that Woody Powell calls amphibians. So coming over the horizon, maybe we're in it, but not far enough that we can say it's here, the Internet 3, where information is global, but change still happens on a local level. We have distributed cognition with people around the world contributing ideas to um, activities that uh, happen collectively, individually, and as a whole, all together. And we have the beginnings, we're seeing the beginnings of personal learning at scale. It's truly an exciting time. In this context, and at Stanford and in the heart of Silicon Valley, MediaX is an organization that is industry facing. There are quite a number of uh, organizations at Stanford that offer people from industry an opportunity to get acquainted with professors, learn about the research, meet students. The unique aspect of MediaX is twofold. One is that our allegiance is not to a particular lab, to a particular department. It's to a uh, core group of questions that have to do with the intersection of human sciences and information technology. And those questions can actually come from, uh, involve people from the law school, from the medical school, from business, from engineering, from sciences, from humanities, from arts. And so Media X reaches across all of the labs and expertise at Stanford to identify people who want to work on the problems at the intersection of human sciences and technology, the problems of business, the problems of entertainment, and importantly, the problems of education. So our, in the heart of Silicon Valley, our culture is not one of building a lot of labs. It's a virtual organization. It's a small organization, just a couple of people and uh, Keith Devlin was one of the founders who set it up this way. It's really a brilliant plan. Um, but what we do is to leverage the resources of the existing labs, the expertise of the faculty, to apply them 
big ideas, but a small concept proving project that iterates quickly. It might last two quarters. It might last a year. The proof of that sometimes is successful in attracting big money from one of the federal agencies or from other sources, but we're interested in small concept proofs of big ideas. And the goal of our collaborations is to do something together that neither could do independently. We're not a job shop for industry. We're not a, uh, we're not a, a place to um, you know, develop new theoretical concepts. Um, industry has, many of our uh, companies that we collaborate with have a very substantial, well-funded labs. But they might have a question that needs an expertise that falls outside their lab. Um, it's doing something together that neither one of us could do independently. That is our goal. Now, to identify those um, opportunities takes some conversation. We're talking with each other in a trusting way, understanding the uh, research that has been done before is one thing, and people can come on campus and hear, uh, read, read, read uh, papers, they can uh, hear presentations, um, but to understand where the future is going, you, ha you have to say, what is it that you want to be working on in the future? And the only way to um, ask that in a very meaningful way is to ask for a proposal. So we do that. Um, and the labs that uh, provide proposals to us, that submit proposals to us, come from across the entire university, uh, from communications to education, informatics, uh, symbolic systems, engineering and product design, linguistics, the entire university. Let me give you an example of how we do this, um, because it is an agile and a flexible system. We are not building permanent activities. We are catalyzing translational research that will use the fundamental science uh, and uh, prove some concepts for broad applicability. Now we know that a revolution is coming in the productivity of knowledge work and knowledge workers. The proportion of people who do knowledge work is increasing and yet being able to identify ways to measure their productivity and improve it is very tricky. One of our strategic partners brought this question to us and we said, well, it's a huge question. But let's uh, see how the brain trust at Stanford would approach it. So we call for proposals and we set up um, the theme by saying there are several things in play now. And one of them is that creativity is an imperative in every organization you hear. We have to be more innovative. We have to be more creative. And so what does that mean? We do know that in a collectivist culture, creativity is more likely to mean building harmoniously on the past. In an individualistic cus, uh, <laughs> culture, it's more likely to mean disruptive innovation. And in global teams around the world who are together assigned to a creative task, they may be working toward different goals. So creativity is an imperative. Another um, element that we considered in this theme was the new ways that are now possible to augment the human brain. Without going into it, we have ways to see inside of it, to see what's happening. We have ways to... Um, enhance and augment the memory. We have uh, uh, computational power um, has given us new ways for the mind to, uh, to leverage what hum the human mind can do. And vice versa, the human mind has given us new insights about how computational systems can be developed. We know that around the world the real work happens in teams. Individuals are are, can be productive, but when things really uh, come together, when change is really made, when productivity is accomplished, it is through teams, it's through collaboration. And technology enhances the ability for people around the world to collaborate, but there are still some things that are best learned face-to-face, -face, in person. How do you make a big sale? 
how do you help someone with a problem? Uh, how do you play, how does a master play an instrument? These are things that it is possible to learn some uh, through technology, but many things are actually learned face to face, knowledge and practice. We're in a time that workflow has been invent is being reinvented. And whereas the local supply chain of all the companies that could take a material into a finished product for it ready for distribution, nah, that's kind of changed. And we can access those materials and the markets and the manufacturing from all around the world. And that's just talking about the physical stuff. When we go to information, we see uh, simultaneous, um, concurrent uh, creation of um, information products happening, sometimes purchased before they're made. And we know that the networks that work now and will continue to work in the future have to be agile. It's as if with a conductor, Sometimes the violins take the stage. Sometimes it's the trumpets. Sometimes it's the drums. And being able to knowing the resources that are available and being able to call them at the right time to uh, pull together uh, a symphony of resources for uh, addressing today's challenges is perhaps the skill of the future. Network orchestration. So we, we put these challenges out and we said we'd like proposals for how would you measure and increase the productivity of people who work with knowledge. We had many proposals that came from, I think there were 62 different researchers and uh, more than 25 projects that were submitted. We selected a number and I, I'll tell you about some that we selected to give you a rain, give you an idea of how the question can be asked, the question can come from business, and the, um, the ways of studying that question can be proposed by interdisciplinary teams. It's not like providing an answer to a problem, but it is a way of enlarging the range of possibilities from which the answer may come, identifying new ways of asking the question, and in the way that the corporate members connect the dots between the projects that go forward, they take back new insights, new capabilities, and a network of relationships for the future. So the projects that we included in this had to do with, you know, knowledge work is sometimes very engaging, but not always. The difference between this guy who's been working uh, eight hours, ten hours at a task that is somewhat repetitive and they may be looking for clues for the Boston Marathon or uh, 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 looking for uh, security um, issues in an airport. This guy and the rep repetitive task that he's addressing is very different from this guy who is his perhaps alter ego in the virtual space. And so understanding how gamification can add engagement to tasks that knowledge workers are performing, whether that be at a telephone center or whether that would be at, um, at a security desk or others, um, is, one of, is one of the focus areas for knowledge worker productivity with great results. Another took, again, the individual uh, perspective on this and said, you know, when people are at the computer for a long period of time, they get very stressed. And as they get more and more stressed, they become less and less productive. So how can we reduce the stress, the stress of um, people who work at the computer? And if you could control your heart, you would have an easy route to that. That's kind of hard to do. But the heart is very strongly related to breathing. And you can provide feedback about your breathing to say, well, take a deep breath. Take a couple deep breaths. And with that, 
a sense of calm returns to the individual. The heart responds to what the lungs are doing. And focus is regained, enhancing productivity. This um, project um, has uh, attracted funding from other sources as it's been underway and has just spun out into a new company that will be testing uh, a variety of feedback mechanisms um, and um, communication styles in that feedback to help workers regain a sense of calm to be more productive. Another project in this um, theme uh, proposed to do this. They said, you know, we think that the way that information is presented, the granularity and the sequence um, has a lot to do with whether it invites people to a conclusion or whether it would invite people to a sense of discovery. And they set up some tests and found that indeed that was true. Uh, and the results of this study have enormous implications for the way that websites are developed, the way that uh, access to whether it's corporate information or uh, technical support or um, information support for a sense of discovery uh, is set up to do. Another project said, you know, we think that by detecting bodily motion, we can uh, identify the roles that users are playing as well as their mental states. And so by triangulating a couple of connect devices, they captured a ton of data about dyads working together and have been able with um, computer analytic machine learning technologies, they have been able to identify the roles of those different individuals. Who is the leader? Who is the follower? The teacher, the student, and are now working on um, identifying the mental states. Um, and the goal ultimately is that, you know, if you can, uh, with the automatic, whether it's the camera in your computer or whether it would be the uh, yeah, the feedback, the camera system on a large um, conference room system. If you can identify that a group is having trouble with the assignment, you can feed information to them that will help them uh, do better. And we're in an era when people are the media. We are the content of our media. And the studies that we have done um, and this is work that Jeremy Balenson has done, who uh, was leading the Connect study that I mentioned, that show that putting a person into the media makes it much more effective for them, have just opened up an entirely new uh, range of opportunities for media content and its delivery. Because it's possible to recognize faces, it's possible to morph faces, and what his studies have shown is that most people cannot tell that this is a 40% morph of the face on the right to the face on the left. But if you morph a face to be more like yours, you are much more likely to be persuaded, to go along, to agree, to do what they say, uh, and uh, to comply. Well, it's very interesting. And this is uh, a capability that um, we're just beginning to um, uh, explore, to understand the opportunities for, and um, uh, to take it into the digital footprints that the massive amount of signal data that's available through all of our appliances, whether it's a car, whether it's a computer, uh, whether it's a virtual world or, again, the massive amounts of um, uh, digital data that are available to um, make experiences more enjoy enjoyable, for one, uh, to monitor facial expressions, for example, for shopping, for education, to be able to uh, take someone's face and show them what they would look like as an elderly person and to talk to them about the importance of financial planning. It's much more persuasive when they see themselves uh, as an elderly person. But it's not just for scientists anymore. Um, this is uh, technology that is uh, 
left the labs. It's available for games. It's available for education. And uh, one of the new labs that has just started at Stanford is a lab called the Lytics Lab. It's an interdisciplinary lab um, of people who say uh, there's a lot of information, a lot of data that's available from the online courses, the MOOCs that are being conducted. Let's figure out how to explore it. This is one of the first papers that has been written on this. And the Lytics Lab, uh, this, is, this is a student project. Computer science, education, and communication. Three students worked together on this project. They just presented this in Belgium about two weeks ago. And what they did was look at the number of people who were auditing a class. They looked at the number of people who were on track with the assignments. They looked for the people who were behind. And they looked at the flow of um, individuals' behavior in an online class and charted this both by the level of class and by um, uh, the progress that the, uh, the change of state that the students were making as they, some of them who started out sampling became engaged and completed the class. Some who started out just to audit uh, actually got involved. Some who started out to take the class uh, uh, dropped out. Just beginning to understand this and it's a great opportunity for study. Again, requires interdisciplinary activity. In this case, students from communication, computer science, and education working together. Here's another interesting uh, project that was part of the knowledge worker theme. And the premise here was that if you look at the way that people open and use files that are on a, an enterprise server, and if those people are codependent on each other for information, for example, in a, uh, a capital project uh, where you have engineers you have designers, you have construction, um, and you have architects. You can predict whether they are going to be on time and on budget by looking at the way that they use their files. So uh, this has also spun out into a business that is now um, uh, in a startup mode uh, with a couple of uh, strong customers uh, Disney was part of this experience and also a um, hospital in the Bay Area has used this to predict, uh, to track uh, the progress of teams that are working together. So some of the other research themes that um, MediaX has um, underway include ambient intelligence uh, and how to understand the context for that. Include this multimodal communications and content management, uh, a lot of data everywhere and how to manage its flow. Publish on demand. When publishing becomes the press of a button, the future of content, what will it be in K-12 through education? And uh, some of the issues of personalized learning at scale. This personalized learning at scale is a very interesting issue. And as you are thinking about the Future Learning Lab, thinking about who can ask the questions, who can answer the questions that have to do with an always-on networked world of educational opportunities that optimize learning for people who come to it from very different backgrounds and have different um, abilities, um, and many different levels of difficulty and assistance. And so some of the research that is needed here has to do with metadata tagging and recommendation engines with digital assessment and feedback systems, with a deep understanding of how to match learner modalities to learning resources, and importantly, the meaning of identity and relationships in the technology-enhanced learning process. It's a very deep opportunity for new research to take place. We have some projects underway on this as a part of the future of content theme that um, put um, a variety of tools in the hands of elementary school children and invite them to build their own uh, content for learning. Um, but I thought that given your interest in the Future Learning Lab of the interdisciplinary collaborations, that I would um, show you some of the collaborations, the interdisciplinary collaborations on learning that MediaX has sponsored. And this is about 10 years, uh, but over half of our projects 
have um, included collaboration between education, uh, humanities and sciences, and engineering researchers. 250 proposals have come to our questions from teams that included engineering, humanities and science, and education. And we've funded almost 100 of those. Some of the topics have been these. Uh, research and teaching on natural language processing. Sensing and control. How do you enable the natural interaction of people with information in the physical world? Learning and training. Video processing, cataloging, uh, and reuse. The technologies for social interaction and collaboration. These are questions that can't be answered by one discipline. Especially in the context of learning, it requires a team of expertise, each contributing something that they, uh, expertise that they have to be able to do something uniquely together. Uh, Human-machine interaction and sensing. The fusion of virtual and physical worlds. Knowledge worker productivity, I, mentioned, I gave you some examples from that. The future of content and publish on demand. So these are all questions that require uh, people from many disciplines to bring what they can do, what they know, to work together. And many of them have an element that is, I think, one of the horizon questions for us, especially in learning, and that is digital identity. What does that mean in a learning context? The universe that is me is personal, yet it's social, it's dynamic, it changes from the morning to the evening, and if an automated program is going to personalize learning messages to me, it needs to know that I am a different person on a Tuesday morning than I am on a Saturday afternoon and needs to respond accordingly. Across the identity spectrum, we've got a whole range of anonymity to verified. Um, some uh, socially validated identities, some self-asserted. And in understanding how, whether it's voting, an identity for voting, or whether it would be an identity for social communication, how um, identities can be uh, described and enabled with computer systems is an enormous opportunity that requires collaboration across the disciplines. We have a Bill of Rights in the United States. I think you probably have something like that in Norway. It was developed for the physical world. We need the lawyers to help us understand if it's sufficient for the digital world and what the bill, Consumer Bill of Rights or, or the Students' Bill of Rights in the digital world would be. So it feels sometimes like you're drinking from a fire hose. I know that feeling. Especially uh, in my environment, I feel that what's coming from that fire hose is fine, fine wine. I don't want to miss a drop. But I am aware that the hose is getting bigger. And in this tsunami of information, it is the information travels from person to person. And it's in that relationship uh, that the exchange of information and the exchange of and the building of a shared vision happens. I just came before I was at, before coming here, um, a meeting that was on participatory surveillance, um, a program put together by the Skoll Foundation. Their premise is this. It takes the Center for Disease Control 23 days to identify an epidemic. We think if we can get citizens describing their health symptoms to us, that we can beat that time and we can be able to identify an epidemic in a shorter period of time. So with a program called Flu Near You, and that's the program for the U.S., there is a, a similar program for Europe and one in Australia. People are weekly contributing just information about, you know, did I cough, did I have a, a fever, so on and so forth. And they, this is the map that I see every week when I log in, which shows my location, here's where I live, and it has turned green, but a couple of weeks ago it was red, and it was red on my map about 10 days before uh, the news reports came out saying we're having a flu epidemic. A great movie on how things spread contact and relationships. 
<clears throat> we there are studies that epidemiologists do on how ideas spread, how diseases spread. There have been studies that look at how happiness spread. Isn't that a wonderful idea? Happiness spreads. And in a population in the northeastern part of the United States, uh, with records that are kept uh, uh, through the health care providers over now several decades, um, they are able to show some of the conditions for happiness, but they're also show, able to show how it spreads. Well, if we can spread health as well as disease, what about ideas? We used to think, I mean, the old ideas of distance and of um, technology-based regional development used to be geographically focused. This map shows uh, different sectors by different colors in um, Silicon Valley, in New York, and in Boston. But this is much more the new way of seeing distance, and that is through relationships. How close is the relationship? This is the way that we used to think about organizations. You're probably familiar with this kind of diagram. The contemporary organization looks more like this. It's personal influence based on relationships and communication of information. So some of the studies that I have done have taken this approach to relationship-focused communication and have uh, looked at the way that communication at relationships for co-creation create infrastructures. Uh, across the executives of companies, the founders, the funders of companies, you see that some people uh, uh, are on more than one company, some people are on more than one board, some people through their serial entrepreneurship have founded more than one company. So I show these relationships as the people, you'll see them in blue, the companies, you'll see them in red, and the financing organizations, you'll see them in green. Now there's a lot of information out on the web, and it's there for anyone who wants to scrape it. We scrape information from, uh, from Facebook, from Twitter, uh, from Yahoo, from uh, Crunchbase. I see that this may be a Norwegian translation <laughs> uh, here, but we um, collect the data, we process and analyze it, um, and uh, it has become a data set on innovation ecosystems. That data we um, take into tables, we use visualization techniques to draw the, stru the structures, and then we go through a sense-making process that is iterative. And it shows us a new way of looking at the world. This is a, the world, of course. This is the world, of course. This is the world of advertising executives. And you see the blue, the men who are executives in blue. You see the women who are executives in red. You see the relationships that either through financing or through um, sitting on each other's boards uh, between companies uh, as lines that connect them. It gives us a sense of an ecosystem. And this is an ecosystem in, um, as you, that you see as you cross the Golden Gate Bridge. It's the John Muir Glen. And you see huge redwoods that have been there for a long, long time. Some of them so long that they have decayed on the inside. Some of them so long that they have fallen over. And there, as they rot, they become the nutrients for the new ferns, the new trees that grow up around them. This is not a story that the big trees like very much, but it is, in fact, part of the ecosystem, and it's dynamic, and it's changing, and it's re changing through complex relationships. You may know this e ecosystem, and you know that there are seasons. You know that there are factors that will influence um, how uh, green the fields are, um, how much snow is on the mountains. And uh, the ecosystem approach that we use is a network perspective that focuses on co-creation and orchestration across segments in response to changing external forces. And importantly, it focuses on shared vision. It's a dynamic system. And I agree that the forces are more than the triple helix. 
and they must include the inventors and the entrepreneurs, but they include the startups, the angels who are willing to give uh, somebody a chance to take a risk, the legal firms, accounting firms, the universities, the banks and financial institutions, the utilities, the industry associations, and it also includes the customers and the markets. Now, you can think of that in a local way, but you can also take a big picture perspective and think of it in a global way. And the customers and markets um, can expand the opportunities. For many years, I have um, had interest in following technology-based regional development. And as I've worked with organizations to understand how do you measure something that takes 25 years to develop, a sustainable ecosystem takes 20 30 years to develop, and yet the spending is going to be on a year-by-year -year or on, if it's legislative, on a two-year or four-year system, and how do you know if what you're doing now is in the right direction? And this, I think, provides some of an explanation. Across the events, like today, uh, like the uh, conferences, like the get-togethers, and the, the actors and the events that are part of that, over time, those change. That's an impact that can be measured. As you look at the new coalitions that form between people, the new networks that are created, you're able to see the shared vision that actually is responsible for the transformation. And the science of studying this involves uh, measuring and tracking that impact over time providing feedback and interacting uh, with the, as the transformation is underway and looking at the co-creation of value. We can do this looking at the um, learning industry in ICT. And so from our data set of about 100,000 companies internationally, we use language, the English language, but most of the companies that are interested in growing and becoming global are, have their information on the web in English. Uh, we identify those companies that have, in their description of what they do, education or educ or educat, some form of, of education. And we identify those companies and uh, look and we identify the people who have founded them, who are on their boards, and the investors. Again, that's the red, the blue are the people, and the green are the investors. And there are about 1,700 companies in the data set that we have scraped, the Innovation Ecosystems data set, that are uh, companies, uh, branches, and financial organizations in the education space. If you look at this, it's very interesting and quite different from that map that I showed you of the advertising industry, which had quite a lot of... Um, inter, inter uh, overlapping relationships, people who were part of more than one organization. And here what you see is that, you know, there are a couple of, there's some emerging networks that are here in the center. They're drawn to the center in this particular analysis. There are some financing organizations that want to be in the educational space, and they're kind of sprinkled out here. There are some that are active in the center. And it's interesting to look a little closer at what's in the center. You can see that some of the um, organizations like IBM, Blackboard, um, are companies that have been um, cultivating, catalyzing uh, new learning technologies, new companies. You can see that there's some venture firms, uh, Cisco Systems, uh, Venture Organization, uh, Capital Trust, um, 500 Startups, kind of an incubator, Liberty Partners. Uh, but it's kind of sparse. It's very independent, not the um, tissue of connectivity through relationships that you find in other industries. In characterizing these, these follow many of the same categories that Elif showed in his uh, presentation yesterday. There are a lot in the software. Uh, there are some in network hosting that are focused on education, some in games and video, uh, consulting, e-commerce, uh, some in advertising, many on the, that focus on the web. And if we look at where the companies that are doing this work are located, we see that the 
Most of them are in the United States. Um, now, this is uh, from data that was um, 2010, and I think it would be interesting to do an update of this because we refresh the data on a quarterly basis. Um, in the United States, um, by city, New York takes the longest bar. Uh, San Francisco is next, but if you put the other cities that are in the Bay Area, like uh, San Mateo, uh, like Redwood City, like um, Palo Alto and others, uh, they actually make a bar that's twice the size of, of New York. So it's happening right in our backyard. The potential of the companies that are involved in education now to connect with other industries can be seen if you go out one level of relationships past the education companies and their CEOs and their financing organizations. Go to the next level of relationships that those companies had. Because if I'm going to do a deal with you, it might be because you know him and I know you. And so one level out uh, can be used to hypothesize, to imagine what the ecosystem might look like in a year, two years, three years. And what you see here is very interesting. There's a lot of opportunity. There are big investors, um, primarily corporations, but there's several prominent angels and incubators here and a lot of education institutions that are uh, participating and strong cross-sector potential. Currently, in the, ed in the learning industry, the companies are kind of dissociated from each other. They're self-funded. It's like, I've got a great idea. I'm going to make a company of it so that other people can use it. But without the, um, the business uh, connections and the uh, value co-creation, the, the value chain uh, put in place, there are great opportunities here. And if we uh, anticipate where some of those, where some of the fuel, where some of the markets, where some of the exit strategies, you might say, might come for the uh, new learning industry companies, we can look at the publishing industry. We've had major disruption in publishing. We've gone from this printing presses and manufacturing process to one push of the button. And looking at Contrasting the enterprise level from the growth level, from the startup level of the companies that are involved in this, it's interesting to think about contrasting as enterprises, News Corp and Holtzbrink. Two lookalikes for Matt Damon, almost. Uh, here's James Murdoch, youngest son, and uh, was the heir apparent to Rupert Murdoch, about 41 now. Um, and the youngest ever CEO of uh, Fortune 100. Uh, he got a lot of attention, especially after the phone hacking scandal in the U.S. and uh, in the U.K. And uh, the Parliament report said he showed willful ignorance of the extent of phone hacking and a guilty, he was guilty of an astonishing lack of curiosity over the issue. Um, he resigned and the... Um, the company which had taken an aggressive acquisition strategy. Oops, all the companies that are in their portfolio and many more um, um, has um, had somewhat of a fall. Contrast that with Holtzbrink Vermillion. Now, this is Stefan von Holtzbrink, about the same age, uh, widely involved in science and innovation initiatives, chairman of the board of the Max Planck Institution uh, Foundation, and um, his approach was different. He said, I'm going to set aside a hundred million dollars and we're going to see if we can invent our replacement. Let's see what innovation might be on the horizon, that if somebody were to replace us, we might invest in that company. And the portfolio of projects and companies that have been stimulated by this uh, approach to not grabbing everything, but enabling the exploration and the innovation 
is very interesting. It will be interesting to see how these two play out. Now let's, that's the enterprise set. Let's go to the startups. And we see the themes that are emerging in the startups in the publishing industry. Uh, emphasize digital media, include education and e-commerce, software as service. Um, they, if we look at the locations and where they are, we see that uh, here's New York City, a major node. Here's San Francisco um, and associated cities around it that are a major node. L.A. and London are also very significant. And um, we see that uh, mobile, e-books, very important in the themes. We see a lot of university participation, a lot of very eager angel investors. What's next for those angel investors? We can get a sense of by looking at the growth industry, the companies that have had an A round or maybe more, and looking at uh, the green, which are the investment organizations, the red, which are the companies, and the blue, which are the individuals, we can see that there are some investment organizations that are heavying up in these new um, digital publishing companies. And um, there are a number of things that are very interesting about this graph. I find this chain very interesting here. We've got five companies that are connected by about three or four individuals and quite a number of individuals at the ends of each. Now you can imagine that if uh, an association between these companies on the end were to be made, that they would um, evolve, they could evolve into uh, some strength. Uh, other things that are particularly interesting to me on this um, are some of the um, companies that are investing, acquiring, doing deals with uh, uh, growth companies and some of the investors. We have many of these investment organizations in Silicon Valley and the uh, funding that they are putting into digital pu publishing is interesting. So when this growth industry it starts to be making investments in this startup industry, uh, I think that we're going to see some very interesting things and games, educational uh, technology companies, um, and e-learning, uh, e-books, social media, et cetera, for learning could certainly be a part of that. Martha, on the last slide, um, are you able to segment that geographically to show you know, what that looks like in, in, in Europe or, or even in the Nordic region? Is that a global? Let's do that now. Let's do that now. <laughs> okay. Where do you think this is? <laughs> can't imagine. <laughs> <laughs> so if we look at Norwegian technology-based companies, the red, their branch offices in the pink, and their financial organizations in green, we see something quite interesting. We see uh, these networks that are kind of, that are definitely regionally associated and cluster around uh, universities that have been producing technology. Uh, producing people who are able to uh, contribute to the companies. If we expand that and we draw in the advisors and the angels, the map gets a little more complex and we see a little more um, con connectivity in it. But if we say, okay, let's go outside of Norway and let's see of these people, wh who their connections are into the rest of the world, the map takes on quite a different uh, appearance. And these two major nodes that are drawn in are Google and AOL here. Uh, what's particularly interesting is seeing that the, these Norwegian companies are connected to Google and AOL actually through investment organizations. This investor has made an investment in this company that was acquired by Google and, um, and similar on this side as well. Um, the dual office, the pattern of companies having dual offices, one in their region and one in Oslo, uh, was interesting. The business locations paralleled the university programs and uh, the international investors um, seem to be drawn in through executive relationships. This is an, an area that has such strong technology 
And uh, I show a map that was created by uh, Torger Rev in a talk that he gave at Stanford um, not too long ago, in which looking at the offshore oil drilling industry and the basis for the technology that created the maritime industry of ship tonnage, uh, identifying the various companies that were a part of that ecosystem and looking at the way that they shifted in their relationships to each other as uh, they transformed themselves into maritime technology and finance becomes an example that's quite interesting and could happen again for education. I think that network orchestration may in fact be the skill of the 21st century. And what becomes very interesting for that is to see the networks that are emerging from Otger. <coughs> Looking at uh, the images of students that I was able to, that I found online, um, these are Otger students. Perhaps connecting uh, this area of the world to this area of the world. And this is a map of the social media landscape of China. The niches, the value-added networks, getting those international connections may be um, very easy to do uh, with the students that are here. If we want to think about the future of learning, I think we have to also think about the future of work. And people are working longer. Tools that we use are now social actors with us. We are interacting with the machines. The microsensors on our cell phones, in our devices, are driving macro impacts. The digital city is coming. Drone journalism, citizen science, or citizen sensors as people carry around with them, sensors that can be used to <coughs> um, help provide a quality of life. Media is in everything now. This is an, an example from the um, museum at the Metropolitan in uh, New York, but uh, there is a new media ecology and it requires new media literacy for people who will function in it. The organizational structures are supersized and around the world um, the uh, connectivity of people through organizations that are related to each other make the personal global. Nature of work is changing. It used to be full-time. You got paid for the time you spent at work. You worked together in the <coughs> same location with other people. There were stable hierarchies, and w what you were going to supposed to do was prescribed, and you were evaluated by your superiors. We're in a r world now where work is decentralized, and it might happen in no particular time or place. And it goes beyond just the cognitive uh, competencies and reflects a way of life, and talent is truly the new gold. I'll skip through this study, which shows a, a network in Belgium and how uh, people, the network helped people compete to talk about catalysts as energy for change. So what are they in a university? They're work-study programs, internships and externships, getting people out of the classroom, getting industry people into the classroom, they're visiting scholars, ideas that come through, new people, new ideas, curriculum assessments that draw in visionary people to provoke and say, go farther, do more, uh, update and think about the future, new stimuli for research and new collaborations that bring in ideas and skills and methods and questions, incubators and accelerators, Network organizations, importantly though, shared vision and expectations about what the future will be. The local ingenuity and the willingness to risk really provides a, a, a global opportunity. It requires a belief in the upside. If you think that by change you're going to lose something, it's not going to work, but if you believe in the upside, you will see the potential for it. It's important to give the entrepreneurs the opportunity to learn. Failing fast forward is a, uh, a practice in Silicon Valley. It says, I need to stop you because we have a break in a very few minutes and I'm sure there are some questions. Could I ask you to round 
I, I would sure be glad to. All right. Uh, two rules of thumb. Two pizzas. If you're getting together a group that requires more than two pizzas for a meal, you're inviting bureaucracy. And play together like a jazz band. Be a specialist in your specialization. Listen to what the others are doing. You know how to do both of these. And I would ask you, what is it that we can do together that neither of us could do independently? Thank you. Thank you. I wish we had an hour. Uh, this is a mind-blowing lecture, Martha, and it keeps getting better every time you present these things. And it's <laughs> Thank you, really, Edgar. Really <laughs> afterwards and we do need some coffee and it's up here behind but I think we have time for two or three interactions if there are any comments or any questions you would want to field to Martha now that we are together here is your chance anyone care to start? Yuna. Yeah, um, I would just say thank you for a very very interesting lecture you're welcome It's 2013 for all of us, right? Yeah, but the, the mentality, the way they think, right? But, uh, and how do you go from, uh, how do you communicate with people who are in these mindset of the traditional way of thinking? And to whom this is very alien. How do you communicate with them? Stories are a great way to do it. And I think that through stories and through imagining the future together, it's possible to create a shared vision. Uh, I think that um, communication uh, requires listening as well as talking. So in telling the stories, it's really important to have feedback and interaction and to be able to change the story as you're um, hearing the way that um, people, uh, hearing how fast people are willing to move. But in terms of uh, communicating, I think that's one thing. But mobilizing for change, I think, is another. And this, I share my bias with you, but I think that what you do is you look for where is the energy, and you fuel that energy. And it grows, and it attracts others. I think that to, um, you know, take a planning approach. I, I'm not so much for taking a planning approach. I'm looking for where the winners are running, and I want to help them run faster. Create the stars. The stars will shine. Other comments? Yeah. How do you think you use the student press the professor? They do. Exactly that. The students come in, and they have questions, and it challenges the professors to enable the students to uh, in their learning experience. The professors certainly have something to give. They have perspective. They have fundamental theory. They have a wide range of contacts. They have world experience. But the students come in with um, ambitions and with questions and leverage, leveraging that, enabling that, um, actually carries the professors into new places. As students leave, they become a bridge for transferring the technology. But getting the brightest students is really important to maintain the, um, the cutting edge, um, the inspiration for the faculty.
I, I think when you say infrastructure, you're talking about assistance in finding the angels. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's a network. That's somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who did well, who's willing to give somebody new a chance. Uh, and I think there are um, personal relationships that lead you to those individuals. And a couple of rules that I'll share with you from Silicon Valley and what to do once you find them and once they give you a chance. And that is that you have to be willing to accept the responsibility for what you do with the money they give you. It's not always going to work. And when it doesn't work, it's really important to notice that right away and to change something. But importantly, to share what you've learned with other people. Because it's in sharing the learning from, it's usually called a failure, but sharing the learning from a failure is the way that it becomes redeemed and it becomes a service and a contribution to the other people. In other words, here's what I did. It didn't work. Um, I am giving that to you as advice. And that, in a way, at least in Silicon Valley, gives people a permission to go on and try something new. And that um, experience of trying, of seeing what works and what doesn't work, and importantly, of getting back in the game right away. And like falling off a horse, you get right back on and ride again. Um, uh, is part of the culture of doing well with the angels. Uh, they want to give a chance. They'd like to make some money. They're interested in the ride. Yeah. Thank you, Martha. This ends our last plenary session. We will be moving into the booth. Uh, the way it's going to work is we split the guests today, and there will be people <coughs> taking you to the booths. Uh, the work session <coughs> that had Martha and Keith yesterday will stay here for their first part. And that's actually an open workshop if you care to hang around after the coffee break for about an hour where we'll try to